Hello, everyone, and welcome to Creative Live. I'm your friend, your host, and happen to be the founder and CEO of Creative Live. I'm Chase. Welcome to another episode of the show here on Creative Live. If you're familiar with this show, uh, then you know what you're in store for. And if you're new, I want to welcome you. This is where I sit down with the world's top creators and entrepreneurs, and I do everything I can to unpack their brain with the goal of helping you live your dreams in career, in hobby, and in life. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are live streaming today, and I know that we broadcast to a bunch of different places on the internet. If you're watching this at Creative Live TV, I get your questions and comments first. If you click the uh, live chat button in the upper right-hand corner, or if you're on YouTube or Facebook or any other platforms, um, I do see your comments maybe uh, 30 seconds delayed. But uh, please share your thoughts and questions with our guest today because I know that you're here for him and not me, so I'm going to do my part to get out of the way. But I want to call our attention to the fact that we are in an era where digital skills, they get a lot of attention. And rightly so. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of argument in support of that. But another POV is emerging where those skills might only have a shelf life equal to the latest fad or the latest gadget, whereby true human skills, uh, and these are skills that are often possessed by mid-career workers, things like good judgment, specialized knowledge and the ability to collaborate, coach and mentor, where these things, they never expire. So enter our guest, Rebel Hospitality Entrepreneur, New York Times bestselling author. Uh, man, I'm very excited. We've been uh, navigating this um, conversation for some time here. We're happy to have him. Um, this is Mr. Chip Conley disrupted his favorite industry twice 26, when he founded uh, Joie de Vivre Hospitality, transforming an inner city uh, motel into the second largest boutique hotel brand, in, hotel brand in America. He then sold that after being its CEO for 24 years, which we can talk about that arc as an entrepreneur, only to then join Airbnb as head of global hospitality and strategy for four years and today's acts as the, st the strategic advisor for hospitality and leadership. Uh, we, we have had... Uh, Joe Jebbia, uh, co-founder of Airbnb on before it was a very popular episode. What is especially exciting to me about this episode is the emphasis and the focus on mentorship, on leadership, on there's so many, you know, our marketing here at Creative Live is very splashy. It's about, you know, hip creators learning new things. And you know what? There's so many in our audience are mid-career workers. And this episode is specifically here to, um, help those folks and inspire all the other folks who don't know what they're missing. So please, wherever you are in the world, and I, I'm seeing your your names and locations tick in from my on my Facebook feed here uh, from all over the world, please tap your keys or give a shout out, raise your hands for Mr. Chip Conley in the house. Oh, Chip, welcome, welcome to the thank show. Thank you, Chase. I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much. Um, well, congrats on a lot. Uh, <laughs> you, <laughs> You've had enough uh, career success for several lifetimes. Um, one of the ways that uh, I was interested in starting, I had two, two different um, forks I wanted to explore as at the front end of the show here. One is retracing some of your history for the folks who are not into the uh, hospitality or hotelier universe that you have um, created. Your so, French so is pretty success. good, Chase. Your French <laughs> is pretty good. <laughs> Désolé, je ne parle pas bien français. Uh, oh, say just, yes. And just just un petit too. peu. <laughs> um, but that, that's one I want to retrace, you know, your steps in that industry, yes. uh, but also where you came up with this idea that, um, mentorship and it, that now is such a critical time. There's a lot of people that are feeling lost and a lot of the, the, um, we are looking for leaders in a lot of places and not a lot of people are showing up for, for some. So um, these seem to be at opposite ends of your career arc. So m we might as well take the left-hand one first. Tell us, uh, a little bit about your early, early career and how you got started. And, yeah. and then we'll, we'll, um, we'll move over to the other point. The, sure. Uh, the yeah. Someone, someone recently said to me, Chip, you went from boy wonder to modern elder. <laughs> how the <laughs> hell did you do that? <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, uh, went to college, went to college and graduate school at Stanford, got my business school, got my MBA there. And, and a couple of years later, I, at age 26, I started, uh, a boutique hotel company. Now it was way early. It was the only two people who had really started boutique hotels before that in the U S were Ian Schrager and Bill Kimpton. And, um, 
it was a motel in the Tenderloin that I still own 34 years later. It's called the Phoenix Funky Motel. Nice. Pay by the hour motel. The biggest, you know, corporate account for that place when I got it was Vinny and his girls. Um, so you know what kind of place it was. A very popular wow. at lunchtime. Um, and, you know, over the course of the next 24 years, I rode the wave, um, the boutique hotel wave, which was a pretty big wave, quite honestly, and um, was able to create 52 unique hotels, each with its own uh, different brand and identity, all in California. I was very conscious about wanting to be the the largest independent hotelier in the state of California, and we were by far the largest. And um, I loved it till I hated it. And we may, maybe maybe we'll get to that in a few minutes. Yeah. But I, I I loved it till I hated it. And um, and I sold it in the Great Recession. I sold the brand and the management company. I didn't sell the real estate, so I still owned a bunch of hotels, the real estate of the hotels. Um, and then it was a couple of years later that the uh, I, there's a yeah, if you've, you've seen the movie The Intern, Chase. Oh yeah. So Robert De Niro, Anne Hathaway. At some point, Robert De Niro says, um, "Musicians don't retire; they quit when there's no more music left inside of them." So I actually knew that I had some music left inside of me. I just wasn't sure who to share it with. And it was about that time that uh, Brian Chesky reached out to me and said, "Will you be my mentor? Will you be the in-house mentor and the head of global hospitality and strategy? And will you help us democratize hospitality?" And at that point. Airbnb was a relatively small tech firm uh, in San Francisco, not a person in the company with a hospitality or travel industry background. Um, and the only entrepreneurs in the house were basically uh, a couple of people who had, had started tech companies. So it was a great opportunity to join. And quickly I learned I was the intern as much as I was the mentor. So we'll come back to that. But I, yep. I, I realized I wasn't the know-it-all. I, I, I had to learn it all as well because I'd never worked in a tech company and I was 52 years old and twice the age of the average employee in the company. Wow. Well, though, so there's a couple of different arcs there. Obviously, there's the arc of you as entrepreneur. And then, as you said, from boy wonder to mentor. And um, re themes of reinvention, uh, this combination, this word that you coin in the book, uh, which if you're uh, just tuning in, I'm sitting down with Chip Conley and we're here talking about a lot of things, but um, one of which recently is, uh, most recently is Wisdom at Work, which you can see my copy right there. Um, <laughs> it's, it already, it looks like I've owned it for six months and I've owned it for about eight days. Um, <laughs> just b a beautiful book. And these uh, you know, part of the ethos around Creative Live is um, is pursuing your dreams in career and hobby and in life. And you have exemplified those um, in many ways. And I want to hear a little bit about how you got started in hospitality, because so many of yeah. our people want to find out how to apply themselves in an area where they have a lot of energy and where, you know, not to be cliche, but if you're going to do something and do it well, uh, it might as well be an area that you're interested in. And how did yeah. you discover your interest and passion in this area? Because that is a huge stumbling block for so many of our listeners and watchers. You know, it, what's interesting, uh, Chase, is that I, I went to Stanford Business School. I graduated quite young. I was 23 when I graduated from business school. So Seth Godin and I were the two youngest people in our class, very nice. we were best, closest friends in, in business school. And uh, still are very close. And, um, I knew I wanted to go into real estate. So I was, I was focused on commercial real estate. Uh, and what was clear to me after about a year of being in commercial real estate development in San Francisco is that it was a dog eat dog world and it was a bit of a zero sum game. So the negotiation you do at an office building with an office tenant, you know, it, it is, didn't feel like it was a win-win. And so interestingly, uh, two things happened at the same time. Number one is, I started having people come visit me in San Francisco who I'd gone to college or high school with or graduate school with, and they never stayed in a hotel. They always stayed on my couch. <laughs> so I had a little focus group of one each time, like, why are you not staying in a hotel? Um, and the thing I kept hearing was that hotels in San Francisco are expensive and, and boring. And, and so that was one thing. And then secondly, our commercial, our small Maverick commercial development company uh, that I was working for decided we were going to potentially do a hotel in San Francisco. And so I got, I was in charge of the feasibility study of that. And as I learned more about the business and I could see the early stages of boutique hotels um, taking off, I was fascinated by it because it was a win-win. I mean, instead of it being dog eat dog, it was more like, God, if you treat people well, uh, actually you do better in business. So um, that's why I called the company Joie de Vivre, which means joy of life in French, because that was our, that is our mission statement or that was our mission statement. Um, it is still the, the company's mission statement. It's now a Hyatt company. Uh, by, owned by Hyatt. 
Uh, and I said, okay, I'm going to go out and quit my job and I'm going to, you know, earn a salary of $2,000 a month, which I did for three years, um, uh, you know, at $2,000 a month, basically $72,000 over a three year period, which is not what a Stanford MBA usually is earning two and a half years out of business school. Wow. But, but I loved it. I really loved the business. It was it, what I realized is my creativity, my, my appreciation for design, um, my natural tendency to be a host and to like to make people feel good. Uh, I went to high school in, in the inner city of LA, uh, Long Beach, called, it's called Long Beach Poly High School, Snoop Dogg's High School. So I knew what it was like to be the other. And so I knew what it meant to be empathetic to other people. And I had sort of spent my lifetime learning how to ingratiate myself with other people in a way that made them feel comfortable. Um, and, and made myself feel comfortable as well. And so, so I just was, uh, being a boutique hotelier was really easy. I mean, I think that in your work, you can have one of three relationships with it. It's either a job, a career, or a calling. And I would highly recommend to those of you listening, find the calling. And the calling is usually something that gets you in that state of flow, that Mahali Csikszentmihalyi state of flow, where you lose track of time. Abraham Maslow called it being self-actualized. And you are doing it because it feels like there's a almost a bigger force than you that is helping fuel your talent. And um, and when you are living your calling, you are you're sort of on an anesthetic. You don't have a, a very high you have a very high pain threshold. You don't feel pain. And that's why it was really weird, uh, Chase, when I for 22 years, I that's how it felt. And I went through the dot com bus and 9-11 and that whole terrible period. But we tripled in size, even though we were very vulnerable as a particularly a, a very strongly Bay Area oriented company. And at the end of the day, it was the Great Recession that woke was my wake up call, <laughs> the wake up call for this hotelier that said, listen, I actually don't want to do this anymore. Wow. And it, I went from calling. I, I missed career. I went from calling to job. <laughs> it hmm. was like there's no dimmer on this switch. <clears throat> it just went from, you know, lights on to lights off. And that's a hard thing to happen when you are the face of the company. You're Richard Branson wrote the first four. I've written five books. And my first book was called The Rebel Rules. And Richard Branson wrote the forward. And I, I remember having a conversation with him once where he said to me, he said, he was a, a little bit of a mentor to me. And he said, the moment you start losing the passion for the businesses that you are not just owning or concepting, but you're actually running them is the moment you start running for the door and you fit, you've got to figure out a solution. And that was really hard during the great recession because nobody wanted to buy a boutique hotel management company during that you know time when everything was in free fall. Um, but I was able to get to, to a better place. And, um, and it was almost exactly 10 years ago, in fact, 10 years ago this month that I sold and, um, that was a hard thing. I, what I will say is that one of the things that a lot of people really underestimate, if you, especially if you're an entrepreneur, is how tightly wound that identity is to you. It almost it feels like a bandaid you have to rip off when you are selling your company. Your the identity of being the face of the company, and and in my case, I had 3,500 employees, being mama and papa bear for the, that company. I was the founder, a CEO. There was I didn't have a co-founder. I didn't have a co-CEO. I was, I was it, and and it it really was a lot of my identity because from age 26 to 50, that's sort of what I knew. Um, but the thing was, I the fact that I had two years to ponder it during the time I was trying to sell the company. Yeah. Uh, and it was doing, and it was all si really quite private. I, not very many people knew that I was trying to sell the company. Um, that helped me to spend two years preparing myself for a life without that identity. And there are a lot of entrepreneurs who don't do that proper um, pre the preparation to yeah. realize that leaving that identity uh, is leaves you in a place where sometimes you feel a little bit naked and lost. Well, the concept of identity, it's amazing that you said that as the perfect uh, lead in because so many people identify with their career and their job and it's a place to hang your hat. And especially in the States, you know, what do you do is such an early conversation starter for better or for worse. Um, but the, the concept of tying our identity to how we spend our time is at the crux of what I 
find fascinating about your work most recently, you know, the, the book wisdom at work is this idea of reinvention. And for so many people who are watching and listening, they either, there's a couple of different paths. They left school and they did the thing that their parents want them to do. And that, that society and culture told them to be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever. And then they've got to this, this point where they realize that they've got one precious life and that they're living a life that someone else, you know, around a script that someone else has written. Yeah. And then the other is someone who maybe had a great run as you did with Joie de Vivre, uh, but the flame has, uh, has gone away. And yeah. in both those cases, regardless of, you know, which camp you may find yourself in, reinvention is at the core. Mm-hmm. And... I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the process that you went through to reinvention. And, you know, we, you talked about it in the book and, and I've heard other interviews where, you know, you, you basically just say, oh, well, you know, Brian called me and, but there had to be, you know, there had to be some internal thinking about what was the right opportunity and what, what was I cut out for? And if, you know, just help us understand a, your yeah. mindset and b some of the tactics that you went through. Again, A, mindset, B, tactics that you went through in order to monitor or support or foster your reinvention of your yourself as a business person. Well, I think if I if the number one thing I would just say is be curious. I mean, curiosity is the elixir for creativity and innovation. And frankly, it's the elixir for life. One of my heroes is Peter Drucker, management theorist who wrote two thirds of his 40 books after the age of 65. Um, and every two years he would study a new subject that had nothing to do with being a business professor. Um, because like Japanese Ikebana flower arranging or uh, medieval war strategies, and he would become one of the world's leading experts on it because what he knew was that sort of passionate engagement and curiosity about life, um, actually fueled his whole way of being. So I would say that my, the thing that I got when I sort of unleashed myself, got my get out of free, I get out of jail free card from, you know, working 70 hours, 60 hours a week in my company was I was particularly curious about emotions and about festivals. And so I actually went and did a deep dive on both. And I ended up writing a book called emotional equations, um, that did really well. And, and it was because I was, I wanted to understand my own emotions because when I was that CEO silently, you know, suffering through the recession, Great Recession and wanting not to do it anymore and felt like I was I was reading Man's Search for Meaning, Victor Frankl's famous book, because I felt like I was in a concentration camp of my own mind. So um, the process of re- learning about my emotions helped me to understand, OK, wow, my the, the emotions run through you. It's when you actually hold on to them and, or you're c- unconscious about them. Mm-hmm. Carl Jung, the psychologist, you know, really, I, I believe he didn't ever say this. This is Chip Conley saying it, but I'm going to mm-hmm. I get this from him, which is. I think wisdom is all about learning how to take the unconscious and make it conscious. And for me, I wanted to do that with my emotions. And then I was fascinated by festivals. I've been on the board of, I was a founding board member of Burning Man. Um, and so I was really curious about creating a website, which was, which was called Fest 300 of the 300 best festivals in the world and an annual list. So we have a Forbes, wait a, a Fortune 500, a Forbes 400 and a Fest 300. Um, and I love that. I figured, okay, that makes for an interesting life. I just get to go around the world to all kinds of festivals and pilgrim, you know, all kinds of interesting things. Um, But I think what I did was the the curiosity mindset and the sense of like, okay, I'm not done. And I'm not living on the laurels of what I've done in the past. We all know you go to that high school reunion and the jock, you know, know, high school uh, quarterback, uh, you know, is still telling his stories about whatever happened in high school. And He's now 400 pounds and, he, and, you know, his best times are behind him. And so I think one of the things that's fascinating is, um, Chase, is you're 48 years old. And the question I would ask you is what percentage of your adult life do you think is still ahead of you? Guess. Just guess. Uh, well, adult, I feel like I just became an adult. So my answer would be 100. But let's just say I, I got – I'm, I believe that I will live to be 120 years old based on okay. some of the conversations I've had here. But so I got 50, 50 years of goodness. No, no, yeah. You should wait, wait, you got, you got more than 50 years because you're, you, if you're 48, you've got 30 years of adulthood behind you. If you start counting at age 18, okay. if you live till 100, 120, you have 52, 72 years ahead of you. So 30 behind 72 ahead. Well, you are, you have 70%, you have 70% of your adulthood still ahead of you. Yes. Most of us don't do that math. 
So I was doing that math and I was saying, and you know, I'm 59 now, I turned 60 later this year. Um, some longevity sites have said I'm probably going to live till I'm 98. So if I live till I'm 98, I have at age 59, I have just entered the second half. I just finished halftime, just starting the second half of my life, ha second half of my adult life, you know, my eight, my eight, you post 18 years old. All of that led me to a place of having a growth mindset. Yeah. And then, you know, Carol Dweck has talked about fixed and growth mindset. So fixed mindset is when you tend to be focused on proving yourself and success is defined by winning. A growth mindset is when you're focused on improving yourself and success is defined by learning. And so if you're, as you get older, if you have a fixed mindset, what you tend to do is your, your sandbox gets smaller and smaller because there's things you can't do like you used to be able to do, especially physically. Um, and so I got to the point of realizing my, my future will be better than my past only if I have a growth mindset. So at age 59, I'm learning Spanish and I'm learning how to surf. Um, and I'm learning, I learning how to cook. Uh, and so I'm learning things that I feel an idiot at these things, but what I learned from my experience at Airbnb was I would have run for the Hills a month into it if I hadn't had a growth mindset. Because my way of being historically was I was the CEO of the company. My ego was big. Um, I was used to being the, the sage on the stage, not the guide on the side. And I, I needed to actually right-size the ego, realize that I was there for the three founders to help mentor them to create a great company and to make them great leaders. And I'm really proud all these years later that they still – the three of them are still together, which is – Incredible. I don't know if there's ever been a company that's hit this kind of valuation that's had three founders that are still actively involved in the business. But I also had to realize that I needed to have a beginner's mind because there were so many things I needed to learn. And often the relationship I had with Brian, uh, who, who I was mentoring, but he was also my boss, was one of mutual mentorship. Well, mutual mentorship is obviously a big piece. You talked about you know, being a mentor and an intern at the same time, that's a, like, if, if we're exploring mindset still, like, how does one have that? Because most people come from the attitude of, you know, how do you, is it just a parting of the ego or parting ways with the ego? How can you both have this beginner's mindset, um, and, and a leader at the same time? You know, Brian and I have, as when he once said on stage, he said, we have um, our, our synapses fire together. Um, and so we, but his knowledge and my knowledge were very different. Um, he said to me, you know, about a month, about two months into it, he said, we hired you for your knowledge, but what we've really gotten is your wisdom. And I'd never really known what the difference was. Um, but what we offered each other was the following. First of all, we both tried to be humble. And that was, you know, I mean, that was something that you don't think of a, a Brian Chesky necessarily as a humble guy because, you know, he had to go out and raise money from venture capitalists and he needed to go out and have all that confidence. But, you know, the thing underneath for those people who know Brian, he's actually a relatively humble person one on one. And in terms of knowing that he wants to learn from other people. So he's got that that growth mindset and that want, that desire to be curious about what he doesn't know yet. Um, for him, what I was able to teach him was a lot around EQ and around leadership. So uh, some of the qualities that you get better at as you get older, um, because we, it's weird, you know, the venture capitalists and, and private equity firms sort of expect these young, brilliant technologists to miraculously embody the relationship wisdoms and leadership skills that those of us who've been around a little bit longer have had decades to learn. But what he, so I taught him a little bit e EQ, he taught me a lot of DQ digital intelligence. And I got to say, I was digitally, uh, not only in terms of the tools I used, was I a bit of a dunce, but I didn't understand what even product was. <laughs> when, yeah. like, the first time I heard pro the word product at Airbnb, I thought the product was our homes and our apartments. Like, no, Chip, <laughs> the product is our website. Um, and so I had to learn the not just the lingo, but the, the way of thinking of how you scale a global network effects company, which is what uh, Airbnb was and is, um, in a way, and that's why it's so funny, wait, like two months into it, he originally just asked me to be the head of hospitality, but two months into it, he said, you're now in charge of strategy. And I said, well, that's interesting because I've never worked in a tech company before and I'm head of strategy for a tech company. <laughs> Good. But, you know, it was a, it was an amazing experience. And what I learned also is that it's valuable to um, mentor, I'm sorry, to intern publicly and mentor privately. 
What does that mean? It meant when I needed to give Brian some feedback about how he was running a meeting, um, I n of course I never gave it in the middle of the meeting, the executive committee meeting. I did that privately, and I did that privately with my own team, with my team as well. I had about a hundred mentees at uh, Airbnb, and frankly, every one of them mentored me as much as I mentored them. But what I tried to do publicly was to just ask questions. And initially, I thought I was an idiot by asking questions, but then I sort of realized that so Socrates, you know, sort of famous for asking questions a long time ago, and that you could ask catalytic questions to help the company and maybe leaders see their blind spots. Um, and then I would, you know, save the mentoring for a one-on-one -on -one with someone. So, you know, that's how it worked. And um, I've had the good fortune of doing that with um, Marion Goodell, who's the CEO of Burning Man, being on the board there, you know, having the one-on-one -on -one with her as opposed to saying something at a board meeting. And same with Gavin Newsom, because Gavin was a good friend of mine who became mayor of San Francisco. I helped to make him mayor. And he asked me to be his conciliary, um, basically the guy who like hung out with him as his mentor in room 200 at, in City Hall at San Francisco. Um, and now he's the governor of California. So, and there's a bunch of other folks I've had the good fortune of helping to mentor. And I just, I've got to say, the older you get, the more this statement from Eric Erickson, a developmental psychologist, makes sense. He said, I am what survives me. And that's really what, you know, we, if you have kids, that's how you think about your kids. Um, if you have a company or you've written a book, that's what you think about that. But when it comes to the people that you have actually influenced in terms of their skills as leaders or as entrepreneurs, that's such a, you get such a high from that. Um, I, I was very, very proud of Brian in this pandemic with how he handled a very difficult situation with having to lay off all of his contractors and 25% uh, of the workforce, almost 2,000 people. Um, and so I, you know, it's that, that you feel a bit like the proud papa when you see something like that. Well, this, I'm curious if you think this idea of being curious and being willing to, to be an intern and bring to the table the mentorship skills that you have, is this, is this something that every middle uh, career person should be thinking about that you have skills that you can offer and that you need to have this, you know, this growth learning curious mindset, like is, you know, how, how important is this skill of developing this relationship between internship and, and m mentor for anyone who's trying to uh, reinvent themselves? You know, Chase, we, we live in a time where we're going to live longer than our parents. Power seems to be moving younger and the world is changing faster. And those three variables have got a lot of people in midlife really bewildered and feeling irrelevant. And so what I call it is I call it same seed, different soil. Um, that was my experience at Airbnb. Same seed, it was me, and actually same industry, it was hospitality, very different read on hospitality. But I was able to come into a disruptive company and help them understand the landscape, help them understand the leadership. Um, help them actually take what was a very niche-oriented business that was sort of millennial budget urban travel and and take it mainstream, turn it into a global hospitality brand. Um, and I didn't do that by myself. That was a whole team of us. But I, you know, I was really the only hospitality person there, so I certainly had a lens that was different than everybody else's. And I, I would just say that that process. I was gifted because at 52, I was tapped on the shoulder. There's a lot of people right now who've lost their job who are 52 who are like thinking, what the hell? You yeah. know, <laughs> this extra longevity, it sucks. If You know, how do you pay for it? <laughs> right. um, so there's a, so that's part of the reason I, 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 yes, I think anybody can do it. I think it has to do with getting curious, learning. I, I think a modern elder versus a traditional elder is as much curious as they are wise curiosity opens up possibility and the wisdom distills down what's essential. And those two qualities together in the same person can be very valuable. But we live in an era that's somewhat ageist and in certain industries, tech, advertising, um, generally marketing, um, fashion, entertainment industry, um, professional sports. After about age 35 in a lot of those industries, you actually feel like you're a little over the hill. So um, part of my crusade is to not just figure out how do we create more modern elders out there, 
but actually how do we help companies to see the value of it? And there's a few studies that have recently come out that shown that we've known for a long time that diversity is valuable in companies, but the focus on diversity has usually been gender, race, and sexual orientation. There's growing evidence that age diversity is the number one variable for effective diversity in companies. Why? Because a younger brain and an older brain usually operate a little differently. And, and so you get that diversity on a team, which actually allows for different points of view and um, and a lack of groupthink. So, mm. yeah. I want to put a pin in team and come back to that because this is a, another huge theme in the book. Um, there's, uh, again, I got a, a bunch of uh, underlines and, and pages turned over about the role and the value of team as the ultimate disruptor. But before we go to team, I want to um, circle back on the the idea of the modern elder. Now, I know that you have the academy, and it's a little bit tough right now because we're in the middle of a pandemic. Right. But just this idea that you know midlife, mid-career deserves its own set of reflections and rituals, and that in a previous world, maybe a world of manual labor, uh, that you needed to rest after working for 40 years. But as you said, you know, the, the, um, uh, the quote about, um, was it De Niro with, you know, you stop playing music yeah. when there's no more music inside, in, yeah. inside you. And you've clearly got a lot of music and so do so many others. So help us understand your vision for the modern elder. Yeah. So, what I, you know, we have an interesting situation like never before. We have five generations in the workplace for the first time. Um, that includes the great generation. So, if you're in your 70s, you're probably, you know, you're you're probably great generation. Uh, some people are boomers in their early 70s. But so, with people in a place where they're going to be living and working longer, either by choice or necessity. Um, what we need to do is to do is learn how to bring almost like an intergenerational potluck to the table. Um, so that, that's what part of the reason why I decided I wanted to create the Academy. So modern elder Academy, it's also known as MEA, uh, is one hour North of Cabo San Lucas in Southern, ba uh, the Southern Baja Peninsula of Mexico. Um, so it's only a two hour flight from LA and, uh, it's the world's first midlife wisdom school. It's a social enterprise, so I don't pay myself a dime. I've built the full campus, you know, not getting any rent because what I wanted to do was give back. I wanted to say, listen, I know people who've committed suicide in midlife, and there's you know, the, the suicide midlife midlife suicide rate today is 50% higher than it was in the year 2000, um, because a lot of people 50%. do feel, wow. yeah, a lot of people feel irrelevant. What I wanted to do was say, what if you created a place where people actually cultivated and harvested their wisdom, and they were able to say, same seed, different soil, able to see how to repurpose that mastery that they've learned that they may actually, they don't even realize the value in it. Um, and then how do you actually take it out to the world and confidently market yourself or even go out and become an entrepreneur in your fifties, let's say, uh, and which is a fat, the fastest growing segment of entrepreneurs in the United States is people in their fifties. And actually, frankly, it's, it's been shown many times now that actually if you're in your fifties, your, your li likelihood of success is higher greater, than if you're yeah. in your twenties. So long story short is, what we're trying to do is address the confidence crisis and also create some matchmaking of younger people who have a lot to bring to the table and older people who do as well. And uh, instead of seeing it as a generational war, see it as a generational opportunity. And so it's been, and it, it just, and you know, Google showed in, in their study, the Project Aristotle study, that the number one variable for teams, to go back to teams for a moment, um, was psychological safety. And there's a, all this evidence that, that actually psychological safety is improved by age diversity on a team because you, and gender diversity because, frankly, you get a bunch of 27-year-old guys in a room, <laughs> all of whom have their own idea of how things are supposed to be, and you're missing collaboration. Put some women in the room, put some people of color in the room, put some uh, gay or lesbian people in the room, and put some old people in the room, older people in the room. And what you do is you get a collection of ideas. But the older people, what the older people do is they create the psychological safety because one of the things that is very evident in um, uh, social studies, social um, research, is that 
as we age, we get a little bit more emotionally moderate. We get, we're able to control our reactions. Victor Frankl fam fam famously said in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, um, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is your power to choose your response. And in your response lies your growth and your freedom. And, and as you get older, you move from reaction to response. Um, and again, I'm generalizing here. So no, be, careful. be careful with generalizations. But there's a lot of evidence that that is true. I, I just, in anecdotally, my own life, like my ability to contemplate something, even if it's just a millisecond more, I claim that as a little victory where the younger me <laughs> would would have reacted and probably with um, – less balance. And, uh, and it, once you've seen that in yourself, you can't unsee it. Yeah. And, and my wife is a, as a mindfulness teacher. So I, mm. I, I get a lot of, and I know your, your long relationship yeah. with the Esalen, um, yeah. there's a lot of, uh, I think of threads we could pull on there, but in order to be in service of what I said, we were going to talk about next, which is teams. Yes. Again, so many, so many, uh, topics I'd love to you go deep with you on, but I, I can't go past teams because mm -hmm. so it's so many of the people who are listening and watching, we at Creative Live attract largely a creator and an entrepreneurial mindset. Mm -hmm. And so much of the entrepreneur story, the narrative in our culture is solo creator sets off on a vast journey. Mm -hmm. And you know, you mentioned Branson Branson's an investor yeah. in Creative Live, a friend. He's the first person to tell you that, you know, team is is at the center of this, despite all these toxic myths that we've got of the lone yeah. creator what, going into the woods. And in in Wisdom at Work, you talk about teams as the ultimate disruptor. Say more. Yeah. You know, it, what, when I joined Airbnb, it was a fascinating experience because um, what I noticed was everybody was trying to be the smartest person in the room. And at one point, someone said to me, I was the wisest person in the room. And again, just like when Brian said the difference between knowledge and wisdom, I'd never really seen the difference. But part of what it helped me to see is that when you create an environment where, um, as I think, I don't remember who, it might've been Harry Truman who said, you know, it's amazing what can get done when no, it doesn't matter who gets the credit or no one cares who gets the credit. And I think there's an element in a team that when a team feels like they are firing on all cylinders, it feels better than actually your own personal um, individual achievement. Um, in rowing or crew, there's actually a an ex, uh, a word called swing. When when the eight rowers and the coxswain are all in in unison, um, the boat starts to actually elevate in the water a little bit, which mm -hmm. means that there's less friction, which means it goes faster. That is a team. A team is in unison by by and uh, when I say be in unison, it doesn't necessarily mean there isn't conflict. There absolutely is. We as a as a as an executive team at uh, Airbnb read you know Pat Lencioni's Five Dysfunctions of Teams, and we did work on that, and we realized that actually having conflict was a good thing yeah. as long as we could al an al align as a group once we had uh, agreed upon what our path was going to be. So we did a ton of work, and part of my role in the company was to help. I was I set up the learning and development function in the company, and so as to help actually the teams in Airbnb uh, work more effectively, and especially the executive team, which was at about ten or twelve of us. Um, so understanding personality types is a lot of that as well. Understanding, oh my gosh, the difference between an introvert and an extrovert, or I'm a big fan of the Enneagram, and how do you understand you know Enneagram types and what that means about the, the overall pair of glasses that someone is wearing. Um, so there's a, there's a lot to it. And I, and you know, there's a, 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 a I, I'm, I can be someone who's impatient by nature. I have a bias for action, you know, classic entrepreneur. One of my co-founders in modern elder Academy last week said, chip, are you able to fly at the speed of partnership? And that was really good for me to hear because it wow. reminded me of the African proverb if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I realized with my two co-founders of the of the company, and I'm I'm the predominant, you know, one that the world sees, and I'm the one who really came up with the idea. But these two are right by my side. I realized I often am so much on my own path about what I think we need to do next, um, especially in COVID, where I don't see them uh, because we're all spread out right now. 
that I am not in partnership with them. Uh, and so knowing your, again, I said earlier about Carl Jung, n- making the unconscious conscious is to me the ultimate sign of, sign of wisdom. And one of the things you get better with as you get older is your own personal pattern recognition, seeing your own patterns. And pattern recognition is a form of wisdom. And so the long story short is I was able to see that my teamwork uh, lately hasn't been very good because of my pattern recognition of seeing my bias for action means I'm impatient, means I don't have time to wait around to talk to them about it. So so I'm, I'm glad I've been able to say, okay, I've, I've been a great team member and I was I think I helped create a really great set of teams at Airbnb and the, and the framework for how we thought of teams. But I can at times, you know, at 59 and a half years old, <laughs> be in a place where I'm not a very good team member as well. And I have to be, come face to face with that. That's actually a uh, thing worth peeling back one more layer on. So, yeah, you've spoken all over the world about this. You talk, you know, about being an an elder and the not just the books you've written on the topic nor the leadership positions you've held, but what part of the 59 year old Chip Connolly is the scared part that people don't always see on stages or, or read about in the books, because that, you know, you seem superhuman when we read your books and we see you on stage, but right now there's someone listening who's 59 years old and has just lost their job. And, uh, what can you, what would your advice be to that person? Well, if you believe that the, your, your best years are behind you, you're answering your own question. (laughs) So, Part of what's been fascinating for me to move from lifelong learning to what I now call long life learning, the emergence of long life learning, understanding how to create a life that is as deep as it is long, um, and that's really what Modern Elder Academy is all about, is to recognize and study social, the social research on this, social science research on this. The U-curve of happiness is fascinating. It's across all cultures. It's gotten a lot of press in the last five years. What it's shown is that from about age 22 to 25 till around 45 to 50, sorry that you're right in the middle of it, Chase, um, you see this long, slow decline in, in life satisfaction or happiness um, for a lot of reasons. It's the mashup of all the responsibilities, all the identities, all of, all of the things that you have on your plate, um, including kids often. Ki- kids don't make you happy, but they give you meaning. <laughs> lots, of re- <laughs> lots, of, lots of research on that. Um, so... What happens around 45 to 50 is if if the equation dis, uh, disappointment or disappointment equals expectations minus reality is relevant here, um, you actually often around this age and your you know mid around 50, you start shifting your expectations. Um, you also start to shift out of the primary operating system being your soul to the primary operating I'm sorry for the primary operating system being your ego to the primary operating system being your soul. Now that gets pretty woo woo and I'm not gonna get into the specifics of that right now, but what I can say is there's a lot of evidence that people actually start to move beyond their own petty needs and they start to actually get happier. And what's weird about the U-curve of happiness is that people in their 50s are happier than their 40s, 60s happier than 50s, 70s happier than 60s, and women in their 80s happier than 70s. And so what I would say to that 59-year-old who's lost their job, who feels like maybe, you know, their life is over, uh, do the math on how much, what percentage of your adult life is still ahead of you, get curious, uh, brush off your wisdom and mastery and have someone help you, whether it's a coach, whether it's coming here to MEA, whether it's your best friend who knows your your qualities maybe better than you do, um, and go out there and start to look for the thing that you most most are curious about and what could be a new industry you could go into. Um, it doesn't have to be the same industry. Again, there, your skills you have, human skills, that pattern recognition, or there's something called crystallized intelligence. It's holistic thinking. Um, as you get older, your your ability uh, from with memory and how quickly you recall things um, actually is less. You're, you're less fast and you aren't your, your memory isn't as good. But you, what you get better at until about your late 60s is your ability to, to connect the dots. Mm-hmm. Um, and connecting the dots is a quality that young people really appreciate in older people um, because it actually is the ability to see the pattern um, before and to be a futurist, to be able to sort of see the future and be able to 
then say, ah, okay, if that's the future, this is where we should go. Um, so I would just say you probably have a lot more going for you. But as you go look for a job at age 59 or 52 or 48, um, Chase and K2 lose your job at 48, um, what you've got to do is you've got to actually find a habitat that's going to be right for you. And one of the qualities that you get better at as you get older is environmental mastery. And this has nothing to do with the ec ecology. It means you actually know the habitats in which you flourish. And so you are very readily able to determine pretty quickly whether a particular company and culture are right for you. And is that, does that just come from experience? Does that come from meeting a lot of people? Where, where does that uh, intuition come from? Um, so intuition comes from pattern recognition and wisdom, and it really it, the intuition comes from the lived experience and what you've learned over time. One of the, the practices that I started doing at age 26 that relates to what we're talking about here that I would recommend to anybody at any age. So if you're listening to this and you're 23 years old right now and saying, who the hell is this guy at 59? Well, here's something you can start doing at age 23. At age 26, when I started my hotel company, I had no background or experience in hotels. And about three months into it, I realized <laughs> I was up shit creek. I had no idea what I was doing. And so I, I, I actually took a, a journal, an empty journal, and I wrote on the cover, my wisdom book. This is a true story, my wisdom book. And every Saturday or Sunday, Friday afternoon or Saturday or Sunday, each week for 30 minutes, I would actually put together a list of about three to six bullet points of what I learned that week. Typically wow. things where I just, I had a bad experience and I had to learn from it. And so whether that was the wrong kind of partner in business, uh, an investor, or whether that was how I ran a, a meeting badly or, um, you know, how I gave a uh, direct report, a review that just didn't go well and how I could have done it differently. I've been doing that now for 30, almost 34 years. And I oh have nine God. wisdom books. And actually, during the Great Recession, I went back to look at my dot-com bus, 9-11 ones, because I was like, okay, I think I had some learning back there that I'm, I need to go back to. So what I'm just saying is whether it's environmental mastery and understanding what it is, where what habitats you flourish in, what kinds of people you work best with, what kind, what time of day you know you are your best at, you, you're, you're, you're at your best, um, these are the kinds of things you learn over time. And... Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you're older, you're wiser, because there's lots of people who are older who don't cultivate and harvest their wisdom, nor do they have an open mind about learning new things, or nor are they curious. So you could be wiser at, wiser at age 30 than someone who's at age 60. Um, but it's all about cultivating and harvesting that wisdom. Well, we mentioned early on in our conversation the, the timing of all of this, and now um, we need guidance more than ever. And there's, well, I, I don't know too many people who were alive for the 1918 pandemic. So the reality is, is that's, that, that subset of leadership is pretty small, but this concept of leading through crisis is, um, not new, right? You, you've mentioned several crises in the, in the, you know, the arc of your entrepreneurial career. Um, but let's just flip the script now because there are, we've taken the approach that if you are mid-career, middle age, looking for another restart, whether it's a, you know something you're passionate about or you've talked a lot about pulling on the curiosity threads to s see an area, you talked about envir environmental awareness and mastery. Let's flip the script and say you are a young person and you are have found yourself in a tough spot what is a good, what, you know, what are, what are some, what's some guidance that you would give us for turning to people who might be great mentors? How, how should you find them, cultivate them and, um, where to look? couple of thoughts. Um, first of all, I, I have a, I have a daily blog and I write a lot about this in the daily blog, which is called wisdom. Well, it's on the modern elder Academy website. Um, and so it's just, you know, you can sign up for it. it's free and you, you just get an email each, uh, each day with a, a little micro dose of wisdom. Um, and whether the, I want to say two things on this. Number one is um, what I'm hearing a lot from people of all ages right now is a lot of anxiety about where things are in an uncertain world. And um, if you go to the, the Wisdom Well blog, you'll see there's a, a, a post, a very short, all the posts are relatively short, 
um, because they're daily. Uh, there's a post uh, called um, the anxiety balance sheet. And I would highly recommend people look at that if you're feeling some anxiety about your workplace right now or just you know your career or your life. Um, because there's really two primary ingredients in anxiety. Um, it's uncertainty and powerlessness. And so the key is to do a balance sheet that helps you to see what do you have some certainty about and how and what do you have some influence over? And in, if you can influence and if you can actually up the ante on both of those, um, it helps you with the the things that you feel uncertain and powerless about. Mm. So moving on to mentorship, um, first of all, if you can find someone that you you can teach as well, a mutual mentorship relationship, that's dynamite. That's like the best thing you can get because then it's a it's a it's a relationship of reciprocity. Um, it'll probably last last longer and it'll actually feel more enriching because you're both neither one of you are typecast. Um, we call ourselves mentors, a mentor and an intern at the same time. Um, I would say look at the people who you look at the qualities that you want to learn yourself. What are the things that you feel like you really need help with? Um, that's one way to start and then sort of start with that and then say, OK, who are people who you admire, who, who exhibit those qualities, whether they're people at work or people uh, in your family life, uh, people, neighbors, uh, friends, et cetera. Or look at the people who you just admire, the people who are um, <laughs> people who are just the kind of people you, you want to be like when you grow up, so to speak. Um, I'll tell you my story. So um, I, about two years after, actually, no, about four years after I started Joie de Vivre, we were getting our second and third hotels, and we ended up with 52 hotels. But, you know, second and third, about four years into it. Um, and I knew that culture was important. And the company that I most admired uh, as a, as a, in terms of the company culture was Southwest Airlines. And so I tried to call Herb Kelleher, who for 37 years was the CEO of, of Southwest, to see if I could ask him if he'd be my mentor. <laughs> and um, his assistant is EA, um, uh, Colleen Barrett, uh, is the one who answered the phone. And she said, no, he can't do that. But if you write him a letter, this is like the 19, early 1990s. If you write him a letter, um, and maybe you write him once a year, if he really likes you, maybe he'll answer it. It's like writing Santa Claus. So uh, I wrote Herb Kelleher a one page letter, asked him three questions about corporate culture and how they'd grown the culture at Southwest. And three weeks later, I got a letter from Herb. And over the course of the next 10 years, once a year, he was my mentor and I would write him the letter. And here's the part that's the great part of the story. I got to know Colleen better than I got to know Herb. I never had a phone call with Herb. He was, he was my mentor and I never met him, nor did I ever have a phone call with him. Um, but Colleen be, ended up becoming a bit of my mentor too. And here's the amazing story. Colleen was his executive assistant and she went on to becoming the president of Southwest Airlines. His secretary became the president of their company. Amazing. And so what I can say about that is don't assume that someone that is far away from you is going to say no. Um, I probably will because I have a lot of mentees right now. Um, so be careful. Um, so, but I would Double, say double-edged sword for uh, giving yeah, us exactly. this advice here. When you write a book about mentorship. It's like, Oh, you get a lot, you got a lot of people, <laughs> but, um, but you know, be open to trying to, to reach out to someone who, you know, who really is you admire um, their, their qualities about them. And in the world we live in today, which I didn't have back there in that era with, we didn't have the internet. You can learn a lot about someone who's no longer living who could become your mentor because there's speeches, there's blog posts, there's things that they've done in their life. There's books about them. There's books they've written. So you can actually have a mentor and learn about them without actually necessarily having them face to face. That's huge. And I think there's a, another takeaway baked in there, which is you received mentorship from her without ever actually contacting them and yeah. there's a there's so much like um uh what would it be called baggage in the word mentor yeah. right but what you're asking these people for is help and advice and every little piece of help or every little bit of advice uh, i'm curious on you know landing a mentor even if you don't actually know them don't i would just i would not start with the word mentor yeah. It's like it's like popping the M question, <laughs> like marriage, <laughs> like date first, go for have coffee or, you know, in my case with Herb, I didn't ask him. I, I really I was calling him to see if he'd be my mentor. 
when I wrote him, I didn't say the word mentor because I actually didn't feel like it was a mentor thing because it was like a once a year letter. But the truth is that actually when you start with the word mentor, it can actually scare someone off because it makes it sound like it's a, it's a really big commitment. Um, and so just start, you know, if you can, if it, you know, by, you know, having, a have, I, when someone writes me a, in a subject headlining chip, I've studied you and I really admire you as a leader. I'd like to learn from you. I'll read that email. I promise you. And then I will respond to that email. I probably will say I can't be the, their mentor, but if they don't say, they don't say mentor in the thing. I mean, if they don't say mentor in the thing. I will actually do my best to answer a few questions um, because actually I believe in karmic capitalism. What goes around comes around and that's true in leadership and in management and in business. So, you know, I, I, I think just, you know, be willing to go out and ask. Last comment question, ask request for your, uh, wisdom is around not retiring, but rewiring. Yeah. It, uh, do you feel like the idea of retirement is almost a thing of the past? Is it a thing that was really designed around having worked so hard for 50 years at backbreaking work or on an assembly line in a factory environment? Is it going away? And if so, or if not, how should we think about rewiring? So retirement should be retired. <laughs> um, and because there's now a bunch of evidence that shows that retirement ex increases your mortality rate by about two years. And the three things that actually sort of fall apart are your purpose, your community, and your wellness. The purpose and the community are pretty obvious because you're no longer wor working you know, full time often. The wellness piece people are surprised by because it seems like you'd have more time to go golf or ten play tennis or whatever. But be because you lose the discipline, of the workplace, um, often you lose your discipline throughout your life. So long story short is, uh, I think the idea of retiring is gonna go away as people realize that they're gonna live a lot longer um, and they're gonna wanna stay actively involved in in life. Spoken. <laughs> you heard it here. For, if not first, certainly the loudest and the most well put. I want to give you a, a shout out. Congrats on Thank the you. book Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern Elder. Um, what's the best place? I mean, we, we've talked a little bit about uh, the Modern Elder Academy, um, of course, Wisdom at Work. And the other place you mentioned, um, say the name of the the blog again at the Wisdom Modern well. Elder Academy. The Wisdom yeah, Well. The Wisdom Well. Um, and I actually post uh, the Wisdom Well uh, blog posts on LinkedIn virtually every day. So if people want to sort of stay in touch and, you know, LinkedIn's probably the best um, social media tool with me. And and on that platform, you're just uh, Chip Connolly. That's right. right. All right. Um, thank you so much for showing up in a world that uh, we, we, the, we are going to live a lot longer than ever thought before and thank you for being a guiding light for so many an inspiration uh and again your wisdom in the workplace having reinvented yourself a handful of times is inspiring as hell so i want to say thanks for being on the show chip thank you chase Good. just an honor to be with you all right everybody uh signing off hopefully uh, be with you again tomorrow Hey guys, what's up? It's Chase Jarvis, founder and CEO of Creative Live. You all know that we have more than 2,000 classes and more than 10,000 hours of learning, inspirational, and motivational content on the platform. I'm super excited to announce a new experience on Creative Live. It's called Fast Class. You've told us that you're busy and sometimes it's hard to dive into a full class from start to finish. So essentially, we're now giving you a shortened highlight version of our top Creative Live classes. You can always dive into the full class with five, 10, or 15 hours of great content. But now, if you're just looking to focus on a few of the highlights or want to be able to skip quickly to something that really interests you, you can now get a shortened, fast class version of that class. We're also thinking this might be able to help you explore a new craft and save time while doing it. This is a great tool to curate your learning experience to help create the life that you seek. 
So you're probably thinking, great, how do I access this new experience on Creative Live? That's easy. All you have to do is be a subscriber to the Creator Pass, and then all this is yours. If you're feeling isolated and looking for creative connection, try tuning into creativelive.com slash TV. That's where we've got a 24 seven live stream from the kitchen counters. I can do that back lit shot that I really like to do. From the studios and living rooms of many of the world's top creators where we're doing musical performances, Q and A's, cooking shows, virtual book tour events, drawing, spoken word poetry, and more. Life passed me by waiting for an invitation when the world is greater than my nation or my occupation. Be someone you've never been. You feel all that adrenaline, it's medicine. It actually helps me feel like my days are more purposeful. I hope that out of this deep pain will come some collective growth. Dive into Creative Live TV today.